Okay, hello everyone. Um, thanks for your time attending today's webex. Um, this is a topic for today's session to, um, on how we can help you eliminate ongoing downtime uh, through your everyday cutting and treatment and your assets in your plan. So hopefully um, everyone here is um, part of the teams that are involved in this type of activity and if not, that's fine, you can share that with your rest of your team when you um, get back to your plan. So on the line today we have myself, um, I'm looking after the monitoring, uh, monitoring control division of IPT in uh, the Asia Pacific region. So I'm a uh, mechanical engineer background, um, graduating from Curtin University in Perth. I've been with IPT now for over 12 years. I've had a variety of roles which has allowed me to um, cross into a, a few different uh, sectors, including um, instrumentation, electrical, and process engineering, and a lot of um, troubleshooting on site. Also on the line, we have um, Avina George. Do you want to introduce him first? Hi, everyone. This is uh, Naveen George. I mentioned uh, I'm product manager for the ILR product line. I've uh, been with uh, IPT now for Six going on seven years, worked in R&D for uh, six years, and um, yeah, uh, uh, really glad to have you guys on uh, on this webinar. And the other person we have on the line to answer all your questions is uh, Dave Rail. I think Dave's audio dropped at this point, so. Okay, no worries. So Dave's been with ICT for a long time as well. Um, he's been dealing with our uh, troubleshooting and sort of applications as well for the ILR product in the field. So he's got a lot of um, condition monitoring background. Okay, so we'll start with the presentation. So the first thing that we want to consider is what is downtime um, and how does this cost a company? Downtime is one of those very tricky topics to actually measure um, because a lot of times you can see physical costs, but there's also costs associated with downtime that are not directly obvious. However, once um, a financial team starts to do investigation into the actual cost of a downtime event, it starts to become pretty elevated. So we're just going to put through some um, industry published data at the moment. There's quite a few different sources, and there'll be slight variants to the numbers, but in general, they're pretty close to uh, what you're seeing here. So this one's an Aberdeen research um, result. So 82% of companies are surveyed where have experienced unplanned downtime at some time throughout the plant. Uh, when, when these events occur, on average, they were timed at four hours. Now, this, this unplanned event that we're discussing here is the whole plant, is in general, the whole plant shut down. So once some unplanned event occurs, then, then that average downtime for that event is only four hours. But uh, as an example, I've seen power stations uh, tend, to, tend to suffer downtime very badly when they have an unexpected one, and they can be out for days. And when that happens, they usually publish very well in the, um, the local newspapers. So downtime in an average of four hours. Uh, and per downtime, the average cost is, in the U.S. is about $260,000. Now, this can vary between plant and plant, but in general, the knock-on costs and lot, lost revenue, lost production, uh, and all the other expenses associated tend to cost $260,000 U.S. per hour. You can see pretty, pretty rapidly the $60 million U.S. Um, so these are unplanned events. Um, as you're saying, the cost of these downtime is not just the cost associated with repairing the actual equipment. There's a cost associated with, you know, the loss, loss in production, loss in revenues. Um, and also, unplanned events tend to require emergency services. So, those contracts, you know, those call out charges tend to be a lot higher as well. So, looking at what is the leading cause and effects of downtime. So, 45% of those companies reported that hardware failure or malfunction played a significant role uh, within the downtime event. So in these cases, then, um, if there's a rotating equipment application, then it would be, could be a failure caused by that that has caused a knockdown, harm effect that shut down the whole plant. Um, maybe it's a uh, other component failure that caused a fire or something like that. However, 
looking at those uh, events where there has been a failure or a downtime event, the majority of those occurred in the second and the third shift. So what we mean by that is we are not we times the times of normal operation where the majority of your facility um, employees are, are working. So you have the second and third shift where there's, there's less staff, so there's less resource to resolve the problem, um, and then and then discovering what um, resolving that event can be a lot more difficult because they're occurring at times and have uh, less ability to get the help that you need. In the digital age, what we're trying to do at the moment is push towards um, preventing unplanned events. Um, this sort of analysis of the market is where where digital technologies can help towards um, preventing unplanned downtime, uh, unplanned downtime. And in most cases, a digital solution will be able to uh, prevent about 50% of downtime events. However, in the market and, and where we are today, we find that the, the only 35% um, of the cases can be prevented. So the goal is to be able to prevent 50% of unplanned downtime. There will always be an element for unplanned downtime that you cannot predict. Um, this can be seen in a natural disaster or some other event, but um, there's no way of putting some technology just to monitor. But at the moment, we're roughly sitting at about 35%. You can see the technology is still growing. Um, the ultimate goal will be to get to 50% or more, but the realistic expectation is 50% is where we, we, we need to be in the future. Uh, the way this has been working through the decades is um, often through the use of condition monitoring. So how has the technology changed to be able to get us to prevent 50% of these downtime events? So from the 80s, there was a lot of manual collection um, and all the equipment associated with that was very expensive, quite large. Um, you would target critical assets and things like that, and often those type of equipment these days are still getting the same type of um, monitoring where uh, very expensive machines uh, require expensive monitoring equipment. In the 90s, it started to move around with the, the large machines from the 80s became a bit more handheld, so you could get a lot of the power and the capacity from these large machines into a, into a handheld device. So this type of technology started to become integrated into the uh, the way that condition monitoring was conducted in the plant. Then we came to the 2000s and wireless technology started to take off. So, so integrating those portable handheld devices with wi wi Wi-Fi started to uh, allow more of the plant to be covered. Um, there are different types of communication methods that are being developed, and then this has um, led to a greater range of equipment having monitoring uh, on there, but there was still an element that was cost inhibitive, uh, especially for installation and things like that. Come 2010s and into the 2020s, so um, new, smaller technology has become available. Uh, data analytics and artificial intelligence as such as have started to develop, and the, so the ability to take these measurement devices uh, from the equipment, the same as the equipment in the early 80s and 90s, we started to move into very small size technology. Um, wireless communications have slightly changed as well in the way that we, we can transmit that data, but ultimately, as devices become smaller and more cost effective, you can start to cover more and more of the plant. So having that frame, frame of mind that, that now with the technology that everyone's aware of, that we're becoming easier and easier to install on equipment, there is some elements that start to um, become more difficult to get planned. So I thought it would be good to, to bring some of those up and, and, um, and how do you get started with, with trying to achieve uh, a result of reducing a down, unplanned downtime event. So when you're trying to think about how to achieve that, you need to think of a few things. So what is the, the program objective? Um, is it just purely to uh, reduce unplanned downtime events, or do you also want to include, include other aspects like reducing the maintenance cost uh, and, and uh, predicting some of the events? So what, you need to figure out what is the program objective. 
Then with these, with that comes resources. So what resources do you have on site? Do you have lots of personnel who can help you with this program? Or are you limited on the size of your organization to achieve this, especially if you're looking for um, trying to predict an unplanned event before it happens? So you need to know what type of resources you have. There's nothing wrong with using your existing resources, but, and then, but the solutions that are available could be that you can supplement your existing workforce or you could um, make up for shortfalls that you might have. Then you need to determine what type of skills are on site. Um, it's often possible that you have someone who can understand the, each type of equipment. Uh, maybe someone's more of an expert in pumps compared to compressors or someone's very good at the steam turbines. Can they also help with the, with the pump types of things? So it's your cross, understanding what um, skills you have and who can cross borders in your um, solution to, to detecting unplanned downtime. Uh, also, if you have a reliability team, some some sites do and sometimes sites don't. Also, where they're located, so are they remote or are they based on the site? Then you need to think about what the current program is doing. So one of the things here is, um, is your current program achieving these results? So, so are you getting... Are you still getting unplanned downtime events occurring even though you've been investing uh, in, in condition-based monitoring programs? Uh, are you using the right technology? Is there better technology than what you have? And one of the analogies here that we've been discussing is um, are you just continuously fighting fires? So, you know, are you getting a failure and then you're dealing with that one and then another one comes along before you've had a chance to sort of become pre predictive? So looking at are you already achieving, are you achieving the results and what are your shortfalls? What, what is causing you not to achieve the results? And that, that sort of leads on to that last bit, what's being missing. So in your program, if you've got, I mean, most customers have, most sites have a um, condition monitoring program or some element. element. Uh, if it's just on critical equipment or maybe there's a walk around event. So but what has been missing? to prevent you from detecting these unplanned failures. So in all of that, there's other elements to, um, to think about as well. So what are the challenges that, you're going to, that are going to occur if you start to change the program that you're currently running, uh, and especially if you're trying to implement new technology? So there are some positives. So new technologies tend to bring lower costs. So in terms of a finance perspective, um, a lot of these in, uh, disruptive new technologies can, can be a lot lower cost, which then leads to the fact that you'll have more sensors. And I think if you're trying to prevent an unplanned event, then this is there's nothing wrong with having more sensors. The more you have, them, the better it is. But when you start to face challenges of how do you collect the data from those sensors, um, there's a lot of different types of sensors and and there's a lot of different ways to collect that data. So you can do that manually. Um, do you need portable devices? Do you need, can you connect it all to a, to a network? The next biggest challenge, that especially these days when, we, when we're seeing implementation of, of these types of solutions, you've got lower costs, more sensors, you're collecting the data, but all of a sudden you have a lot more data. Um, that in itself becomes a big issue, and you'll see all of a sudden you have this huge number of issues that you need to review, and you've got a lot of alarms occurring, and you've got and you start to panic. So, you need to be if you be aware of these challenges up front, you can uh, slowly overcome them uh, and prep, prepare your organization to deal with them. So, to make the to deal with the high number of reviews that you're going to all of a sudden have, um, you need to make sure the data is useful. It can provide you with accurate diagnostics. Um, it can help you identify changes, and then you can come out of that with fast action. There's no point putting huge amounts of sensors in the field and then all of a sudden have lots of data coming through, and you know whether that tells you there's an issue or not automatically, but you have all this data coming through and then you do nothing with it. That's not going to get you to your uh, to the solution of. It's not going to be part of the solution to solving unplanned downtime. Uh, we tend to find that you know, sometimes when you put a lot of sensors in the field, it doesn't mean that the equipment that you first installed them on was healthy to begin with. So often we find that 
as a statistic of some experience we've had on site, that there could be 20 to 30 percent of sensors immediately detect the problem. Uh, and that's when the panic mode comes in. It's like, well, we have so many alarms, and why do I even want to know that? So there's a different element that I call the roadblock. Um, it, it happens in most organizations, but it's definitely some challenge that needs to be considered at the beginning. And, and then what is the type of solution if it can, can help resolve this? So one of the challenges is culture. Um, you need to get the culture of the workplace and the technology that you're using to work together. Um, you know, if, if you have people resistant to change, then that's obviously going to be something that you need to deal with. But it's more that you have procedures and policies in place that, that might not allow the technology to bring forth its um, potential. So these things need to be considered and, and then how they're used and, um, within your organization. And once you have that resolved, you're going to see the highest impact. So if you can if you can fix all these challenges and, and, and sort of think about them before they come, just think about what does the technology bring, uh, how much information is it going to bring. It, you know, it's, it's going to be a lot more than what you're dealing with um, from a monthly walk around, for example then you need to figure out how that's going to be processed through your organization. So in terms of um, condition monitoring with, with, with smart technologies, the way the, most of the elements of those challenges can be resolved through the technology. So if you have, as we said before, that there was um, uh, information coming in, data, then it's important that the technology that you're considering will bring elevated events and um, changes in the data up to your attention. So part of a successful program includes knowing when to ignore information because obviously too, so much is coming forward. You would be better if you can not look at anything that's healthy and then only look on things that are of a cons area of concern. So having a system that easily identifies the healthy as opposed to the non-healthy will, will, will eliminate a lot of your data processing manually. Um, automated an analytics uh, then come, become a, a critical part, especially when you've got issues that are occurring. Um, and then having a trusted method of data analytics is also important. You, you know, if you're having to create your own rules, then what is the risk that you're not actually capturing all the events or the potentials that there are? So using a um, system that has the ability to order, order, detect issues from the beginning is, is important. Um, also making sure that the system can give you early warnings. So, um, one key element that I, I, I mentioned to most people that I discuss with is everyone's quite familiar with having condition monitoring on highly critical assets. So in a power plant, it's quite possible that or it's quite often that there'll be a lot of condition monitoring on the main, main turbine. Now, those settings in the turbine, if you were, if you were just to look at why they're connected and when they're connected to a DCS or the control system, they're often set with limits that will turn the, the asset off once it hits a certain level. So maybe um, you are turning the equipment off when it hits the absolute highest vibration level that it's allowed to operate at and, and it automatically shuts down. Again, that immediately at that point, that is an unplanned event. Um, but your actual monitoring system causes that. So if we can use the technology to complement the existing protections because there is no way you want to turn that protection off, but at the same time, you do not want to shut down the plant earlier than you need to. So using the latest technology and analytics, you can uh, set your alarms and your thresholds and warnings before that separate to what you would have for your trip settings. So your trip settings will turn the plant off, but your alarms and warnings can tell you information earlier. So supplementing your existing system with new methods and techniques will, will help you prevent these unplanned events. Um, it, you know, the last thing you want to do is have a, uh, the alarm tell you that there's a problem as soon as it shuts down. So these days as well, connecting all that data and getting systems to work rapidly, uh, cloud solutions starts to become quite important 
there's often there's no one system that will will solve all of your equipment issues. So you need to start considering how to interconnect all the solutions. Also, there will be different expertise out in the market. So where there's there's some people who are very good with pumps uh, and others who might be good with turbines. So you, you can bring these types of skills into one system. And cloud-based solutions definitely help resolve a lot of that. And they're quite and, and the security can can keep people out of the system, um, but bring multiple systems together. Also, um, with cloud-based systems, you can you can allow access to remote parties. So, whilst you we were saying before about what is your your skill set available in the plant, uh, where you're lacking the skills, you don't necessarily need to bring someone in to do that. You can uh, get an outside source to help. One thing that's pretty critical towards um, the whole solution is how to keep it flexible and agile. Uh, it's important to be aware that technology is changing continuously and you don't want to necessarily lock yourself into one uh, solution. You want to be able to have a solution that can adapt as technology changes and bring more more information. So in that regard, we're, in this situation we're looking at, um, in this presentation we're looking at rotating equipment. So what type of sensors do you need to consider for that information? So part of your setup, you need to figure out what, what you need to determine the asset health. Uh, you can start very simple with um, vibration and temperature, but you may need to consider to add um, pressure and, and other things like ultrasound. So you need to make get the, the right tool for the right job. Um, then there's elements about how do those sensors work. So are they just flagging out a known issue? whether that's so we, we call that hand raiser. So is it, is it just flashing an alarm when something reaches a certain limit or is there an ability on that sensor to um, to help you diagnose the event or or give you earlier detection than what an alarm might happen? Um, I've got some examples coming up about how that works. So you also need to make sure that your quality of the data coming through is accurate and repeatable. Um, there's no point having a sensor that's changing its accuracy over the time, uh, its lifetime, you want to make sure that the sensor is giving you the same information over and over. Uh, having a, a sensor located in one location is a, and never moving it actually gives you the ability to measure that same point in, in time over and over. And the way that the people, uh, if you had a manual version, someone might be installing it slightly different every time. Uh, maybe they're putting it in a different position compared to someone else and so you can't be sure that your data is uh, repeatable. Whereas with a, a, a a sensor located in the same spot, you know that it's not going to change. Uh, those other factors are not going to change. You need to make sure it can fit in your environment and it has some sort of onboard memory. If if it doesn't have onboard memory, then you may risk losing uh, information, especially if there's connectivity issues or you're relying on another part of the system. Um, installation then becomes very critical, especially if you're trying to put out huge numbers of these types of sensors. Um, Covering as much of your plant as possible is key to getting these un getting rid of these unplanned events. The unplanned events tend to come from locations that you're not monitoring um, continuously. Uh, connectivity is the next issue. So how does that help you with your information? Um, how will it bring that to where you need it? Um, and making sure that you can access the sensors remotely or locally, depending on what your needs are and, and where they are compared to your people. So if you have assets that are located quite far from where your personnel operate, then you want to consider having that connected remotely. Whereas if your people are around the area all the time, then maybe that is the solution that those people can be continuously easily connecting to the device. Uh, the last thing there with connectivity is scalability. Like how, how every time you add a new sensor, do you need to increase the other parts of your network or can you reuse the existing components to just increase the quantity of sensors within that? Uh, data management, as we mentioned before, it starts to become an issue, like how do you deal with all that data? Um, there are ways that you can have that embedded on site, so you could create your own historian and things like that, but the quantity of data coming in can be quite a lot higher than it was in the past. So if you were, if you previously you were monitoring, let's say, 10% of your plant, and then all of a sudden you're trying to aim towards 100% of your plant, can you actually... Um, systems handle that. So 
having that information stored on a cloud means you can reduce the, the capacity that you need on site, but also having that information viewable in a user-friendly format becomes critical. If you don't, if you have the data coming through as just a set of numbers, then it's a lot harder to interpret what's going on than if you had that coming through as a graph that represents change. So also having the ability for that data to be accessed by all of the team rather than just one person. Uh, earlier on, we were showing about that, you know, you've got to consider your resources and you don't, and you want to remove any roadblocks. So if you only have one person who can access the data, say, through one software system, and you're restricted to the number of users for the license, then what if that person is not available? I mean, how would how would you then be able to access that information? So making sure it's flexible for the whole team to access uh, to suit their skill levels is also important. Then, then reporting becomes critical because you don't want to be sitting there dealing with huge amounts of data and um, <clears throat> manually reporting on those systems. So having automated reporting become, uh, is an important element as well. When you do identify a problem, um, you need to be able to deep dive into that data, uh, whether it's manually or, or automatically, um, having additional information that, that provides the right answer to what you're starting to see in terms of change can be really critical to help you get that fast response. So if you have a sensor that's only capturing an overall vibration, um, then is that enough information for you to make a, a fast response? If you have a sensor that can provide you a vibration spectrum, then will that then provide you more information to help you predict what's coming ahead or, or, or what the cause is and, and help you change your plans for that? So in general, the more information you have, the better, but is it actually the right information? to help you make those decisions. Um, automatic diagnostics. So there's a couple of um, misconceptions sometimes about what is available and what's the best answer. Um, there, we, we can break it down into two elements, rules-based technology and machine learning. Uh, you can do a lot of research on this online. There's all different things about it. But rules-based technology, rule-based rule -based diagnostic would, tends to be more robust and more reliable. Also, the people, depending on how you go about this rules-based technology, often the, the, those rules can have been in existence for quite a while, and they're just being used in a different method. So maybe there's a, for example, there might be some rules that a specialist company uses for their quick processing of their data handling multiple sites, and that, that they can start to share that with with you in your technology. Whereas if you have to create your own rules, it's often that you're going to be doing that based on learning and um, it's not going to be as mature. Uh, but if you can get a proper rules-based system, they will be the best solution because machine learning, uh, we're saying here it's in its infancy stage. It's true, it's very uh, early and it will probably develop into a more robust solution in the future. But the problem with machine learning can be that you, you need a failure to occur for you to then learn that that's a fail, that, that that failure will happen again. So if you have a downtime event and you in, engaged machine learning, as long as you captured all the data you could possibly capture before that, you could then apply that to the next event. However, it's still going to maybe need a few events to occur before it properly learns the patterns that it's looking for. Because again, you don't want false alarms and things like that. Also, when you have machine learning, you need a lot of data labeling. So you need someone to go in there, really do a full-on root cause analysis and what are the indicators, and then that, that knowledge needs to be brought out to help the machine do the, with the learning element. Um, in the future, it's going to be the way to help with prediction before events occur, although rules-based technology can uh, rules-based diagnostics can already give you some early stages of predictive maintenance, depending on when, when you look at it and when you act. So if we're looking at a real-time case study of how this applies, I'm just keeping it very simple. Um, in this example on the left, we have this uh, preventing a downtime event on a, on a boiler feed fan. So it was noticed during their routine type activities that there was an elevated vibration. Uh, so sensors, ILA sensors were installed 
to more closely monitor that equipment. So they were put on their um, inboard and outboard bearings, and they didn't need to shut the machine down. So they could, while the machine was running, they added some extra sensors. Now with the with that, they were able to quickly connect to the this sensor through the mobile application, and that allowed them to continue, monitor the equipment more closely. They don't need to have someone standing next to the equipment. They can just check it more on a, on a routine basis but have an increased amount of data so they can quickly see as changes are occurring. In this situation with the technology, um, you know, it cost them under $1,000 US to add that in, and then it was less. Uh, within an hour, they started having data. Um, early detection... Uh, sorry, changing the alarm limits on this type of sensor will also be able to give you some threshold to when the event started to double. So, for example, if you're, you're having an increase in vibration, you can manually adjust the, set, the alarm level so that you can have these warnings come up uh, earlier than you would maybe for a trip in your plan. The other element then is um, reducing input mortality. So, as we mentioned, sometimes you do will, you will overhaul an equipment uh, and that was part of your planned maintenance event. So maybe you, you've seen that an equipment is due for its federal service. But then once you reinstall the equipment, there maybe something wasn't in the most perfect condition. can often happen with alignment. But in this case, with what we detected on this uh, infant mortality example is that once the equipment was installed, there was an issue from the beginning with the thrust pad. Now, often people... Uh, put a new piece of equipment, uh, an overhaul piece of equipment back in, and they don't expect to have to be able to take that out again. So knowing that from the beginning that you've got that issue occurring, you can turn an unplanned event into a planned event. So you, you can monitor that uh, imperfection that's gone in from day one and then just look for the next schedule to take that out successfully without having a, a um, an unplanned event. So one key element to prevent, uh, to eliminate unplanned events is to turn an unplanned event into a planned event with the latest technologies. So here I'm just going to quickly show you a, a case study and then we'll be able to open it up to some questions. Um, this is a customer who installed a sensor onto a centrifugal pump. Uh, prior to the installation, there was no data on this equipment. When it was put on, these uh, peaks and troughs are the equipment is um, turned off when it's down low, and then every time they're turning on, we could see this vibration coming through. These are just overall vibrations on the trend on the timeline. But, uh, through the life of this, uh, when the sensor was installed, there was nothing really un uh, noticeable at the beginning. However, once after a couple of months, uh, we started to see these random spikes occur in the vibration data. Uh, here with the sensor that was on, uh, you can see that the alarm level was quite low. This is in millimetres, so it was about uh, three millimetres or three and a half millimetres was the alarm limit put onto that sensor. So once we had a crossing of that alarm limit, uh, these triangles here are showing that there was an alarm event captured. So when that happened, we were able to get a um, vibration spectrum off that, that asset, and from that vibration spectrum, we could run a diagnostic, and then we found that the diagnostic indicates that there was roller bearing wear. So very quickly, you can take uh, trend data. You can see the event occur, crossing of the alarm, but because the sensor automatically captures additional information, a vibration spectrum at the alarm triggered event, we can take that to try and figure out what's wrong with that equipment. And in this case, the, recommend, uh, the, the, the fault was coming through as a bearing fault and that you needed to monitor the equipment for increased vibration. Looking at the spectrum in more detail, we could also specifically say that this was an outer race bearing defect. In, um, the type of vibration spectrum results that were coming through told us that there was an imperfection on the outer race. Uh, so in this case, as per the instructions, the, the system... Uh, alarm level was changed, so there's an increase from three millimeters and it was put up to a very high limit, like the final limit that the customer decided before they were going to pull the equipment out. And it was monitored for several more months. So 
previously the first alarm came up in, up in October 2019 and they continued to run the pump and then all of a sudden in January 7th uh, sort of region, the alarm level started uh, showing that it had gone up quite substantially since then. So again, we have another alarm event occurring with this triangle, but uh, at that point, the customer said, that's it, take the pump out. So in that event, the pump was taken out. Uh, it, it ran as long as possible. The customer made sure they had all the equipment, so the, the, the parts that they needed, so replacement bearings were already ready, sitting on standby. And, it's, and then they planned to have this equipment come out as soon as they saw the higher vibrations. So everything was ready. Uh, once it was taken out, it was rapidly returned to service, I think, within four hours because it was pretty simple to change the bearings on this equipment. Uh, after the event, we were, we took the bearings and we opened them up and we were able to find the imperfection that was, was diagnosed by the ILO. So in this case, uh, instead of the customer reaching a point where we were here on the 7th of January and getting... You know, within a day, we would have had a, a complete and utter destructive failure of that pump. Instead of having no notification, in this event, they had three months worth of planning. So, again, just changing that unplanned event to a planned event. There, in this particular application, there was no knock-on event effect to any other parts of the plant. They just needed to make sure that they were ready so that they could continue this equipment in service because um, it was an intermittent duty. Um, so, yeah, hopefully that shows you makes you understand what types of um, events we can we can detect with these new technologies um, and then how to go about selecting that. So 